Thank you very much. I'm Chris Dickey. I'm a faculty member at the College of Global Public Health here at, at NYU. And uh, thank you for coming out and giving us your time on a Sunday afternoon, a beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's really fantastic to share a stage with so many talented and brilliant thinkers and, and experimenters and great speakers. So I'm here, my job today is to tell you and to convince you that looking at public health through a different lens actually gives you an advantage over looking at it through sort of a traditional type of public health. And when I got into public health, and I think in most cases, public health is an area that tends to look at linear solutions to problems. So we have an agent that causes a disease and a number of people are affected by it. And so we think that removing the agent or preventing people from getting exposed to the agent is enough to solve the disease. That's a linear way of thinking. And in truth, public health and life really is much more complex than that. And usually the disease, the disease itself is more a symptom of what is going wrong in a larger society. When I got into public health, and whenever we all do, some of our public health students are here now, in the very first class, or among the first classes, we look at John Snow, uh, not the Lord High Commissioner of the Night's Watch, um, but John Snow was a 19th century physician in London, and in 1854, he was faced with a cholera epidemic that was killing a number of people. And what John Snow did was he mapped out the cases of cholera and found that there were a, a number of cases that seemed to cluster around wells. And the solution that John Snow came up with was to remove the handle from the well. And the cholera epidemic was ended. And we, we tend to see that as being a triumph in public health, and of course it was. It was a great triumph in public health because he was able to use science and statistics to decide how to deal with a, a public health emergency. And in fact, it's carried through today to how we look at challenges. So if you were to go into public health now, you would probably become a health policy expert or an epidemiologist, or you might get a specialty in immunization or in child uh, health. And in fact, it carries all the way through to how we do international development. If you were to get hired at UNICEF or at, at uh, WHO, you would become a specialist in a very specific area in public health. You could be involved in HIV or in nutrition. And, and that could be your, your career. And you would spend much of your life looking at public health or the, the problems from a very specific silo. The danger is that if you're a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail after a while. And you start to see them really as very specific types of challenges. And those silos can actually prevent you from seeing the complexity of a public health challenge. So we at the College of Global Public Health here, it's a relatively new college, although public health has been at NYU for over 40 years, we tend to look at these types of challenges in a multidisciplinary way. We think it gives a, a better lens into the complexity of the problem at hand. And so I have a couple of examples. One that we look at very frequently is obesity. If you think of obesity as a public health challenge, if you talk to people who see it as a linear problem with a linear solution, it's just a, an energy balance problem, right? It's just how many calories are coming in on average and how many calories are going out on average. But in truth, it's way more complex than that. Obesity as a societal challenge has to do with individual psychology. It has to do with group psychology. It has to do with individual activity or the activity environment. How easy is it for you to work out? It has to do with physiology. It has to do with food production. It has to do with food consumption. So all of those pieces are areas when you start to look at it, you can see that they all have an impact on the challenge of obesity and that the obesity is really a breakdown of all of those complex features in society. And the other piece is that they're interrelated. You can push down on one area and it's gonna probably change another area. And so if you look at that as a complex challenge using what we call a systems approach, you're much more likely to find something that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna have a long lasting impact for you. 
And the other piece is that if you look at health challenges that way, you're more likely to see unintended consequences. So if you're going to do something to try to change the outcome, you can start to see how the, the unintended consequences might outweigh the benefit of the choice that you made. So in that, uh, in that, in that context, we've designed a number of courses here. So we've designed a course working with UNICEF on behavior and communication strategies and epidemics, where they bring in those people that are siloed from around the world, and they bring them to us, we mix them together with our students, we have them work on real challenges, on cholera, on Zika virus, on Ebola, and we, we specifically task them with trying to look at these problems as a, as a symptom of a greater societal challenge that they need to address. And in fact, it's incredibly effective. And, uh, and we've seen them with the UN, it's, there's a, 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 real, um, a, a real, um, now a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a trend for them to train their senior staff using this type of an approach. It's very, very powerful. And what we do in this case is we put everybody on teams. So we'll have their students and we'll have our students together on teams. Everybody on the team gets an avatar. They'll be an environmental scientist, they'll be an anthropologist, they'll be an economist, they'll be a political scientist. And in that avatar, they're tasked with looking at the challenge from that perspective. And very importantly, we give them an avatar that's outside of their day job. So if you're an economist in real life, we're gonna make you an anthropologist during the course. And we're deliberately trying to get people to be uncomfortable during the course of that, that two-week or three-week course that we do. And, and what we've seen is that by being uncomfortable, everybody in the class is looking at the problem through a different lens. And the benefit for us is that we're getting new solutions, we're getting innovative solutions, we're getting workable solutions, and we're getting, we're getting ways of approaching a challenge that they hadn't done before. So they can approach it and return back into the field or our students can get a job with these agencies and they can have a benefit, they have an advantage over people that have only looked at it in one way. And what I use as an inspiration on this, there's a company called Innocentive that was started maybe 10 years ago in uh, Indianapolis <clears throat> um, by a company called Eli Lilly. And Innocentive, the, the management at Eli Lilly realized that having a bunch of PhD chemists on staff to create molecules was ultimately inefficient. So what they did was they put the solution out into the cloud and they thought, well, let's see if we can get people who are not working for Eli Lilly who can make molecules more cheaply and more efficiently than our chemists can. And so they did and they offered a prize and they got people who made solutions who are coming from India and from Sub-Saharan Africa and from Latin America. And they got better solutions than they would have gotten from their own scientists. It was pretty amazing. And so they thought, well, maybe we're onto something. Let's see if we can solve other problems this way. Let's solve biology problems this way, or chemistry, or physics, or environmental health problems. And now that the company's been there for about 10 years, they've had thousands of these problems solved. And so about two years ago, a number of professors went in and they looked at the types of problems that were solved and who solved them. And what they found was that the people who solved the problems were more likely to be people who came from other disciplines than their own. So it was the physicists that were solving the biology problems. And it was the chemists that were solving the environmental health problems. In fact, the best predictor of the likelihood of solving the, a problem was how far away the person was in terms of their education. It's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. So having that lens and the ability to look at something completely differently and to be able to look at it as a part of a complex system meant that these had a greater chance of solving these problems. And we see that. It really works. I mean, we can probably talk to any of our students that have taken these classes, and they're innovative. You don't find them at other colleges. NYU is way out in front of other places with this. But if you talk to our students, they'll tell you that this approach is a new way of doing it, it's a powerful way of doing it, and it's a way that we can really address some major challenges. So I'm delighted to be able to, to tell you about it today. Uh, I'm really honored to be here with you, and I think it fits perfectly within the, the context of this, um, 
this great event that we have the framing and the lens of looking at it through a different lens that really shows you how powerful this approach can be. So thank you very much.